Thanks so much for joining us this morning on this Sunday morning, hot, hot, hot Sunday morning here in uh, the, the Vancouver area, much hotter than we're used to, but um, delighted everyone has joined us for worship this morning, um, either live or as you watch this uh, when we post it uh, asynchronously. And we are particularly delighted this morning to welcome the Reverend Dr. Ross Lockhart. I'll say a little bit more about Ross when we get to that part, but Ross is doing our monthly interview sermon with us this morning, and we're delighted to have you in the mix, Ross. Thanks so much for doing this with us. You will be muted for most of the service. Um, there's a chat box that we use for the word to ponder just before the sermon and for the prayers of the people. Uh, just to give you a sense of the flow of our time together in these worshiping sessions, uh, we believe that worship is an act of God in which we participate, an act of the triune creator. And so the Trinity draws us together into a space that is safe and that is marked by hospitality, hope, and healing for the conversations that nourish us to flourish in the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. And so we're welcomed by God into this space, welcomed together. Um, we wonder at the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ that we encounter in this space together. Uh, we wonder at the wisdom that it generates for our missioning, for our uh, blessing of the world as ambassadors of God's forgiving and reconciling love. And we're equipped to be witnessing partners with the Spirit in caring for God's creation. So that's what we're about to encounter. That's what we're going to engage in. And we want to say a deep word of gratitude for participating in that with us. We do acknowledge with respect and gratitude that Brent Wood sits on the traditional and unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. We remember that the Presbyterian Church in Canada confessed in 1994 to our misrepresentations of Jesus in our relationship with our Indigenous kin. And we are understanding ever more deeply and lamentably uh, the implications of that misunderstanding and those misre misrepresentations um, in recent days. And so we, we pray that we can move from a sense of sovereignty to a sense of stewardship together in our mutual care of God's creation. And we give thanks to Melanie Gleason Lyle for permission to use this wonderful image um, that she did several years ago called Stronger Together. We ran into Melanie when she was uh, singing in the Marcus Mosley chorus uh, when they were rehearsing at Brentwood. So we're deeply grateful to her for this powerful image. This is a song that Ben wrote soon after coming to Brentwood that we use to draw us together on Sunday mornings. So let's pray together as we're welcomed into worship. You draw us here with welcoming love from neighborhoods of struggle and strife, bearing stress injuries of all kinds. In the safety of this sanctuary, you heal us into greater wholeness. 
nourishing our souls to flourish in your mercy and grace. In this place, in this time, at this point in our lives, inspire and equip us to be faithful, wise, and effective ambassadors of your forgiving and reconciling love. And in the humidity of Lynn Valley, the matches won't light. And I just happened to buy a lighter yesterday, so that would be a <coughs> providential act. Let's pray. Your passion for saving the world, saving your beloved creation, dear Lord, calls to us through your Christ, through the words that witness to him, and through our fumbling actions as your ambassadors. Forgive and reconstruct our lives so that we partner with you in saving your home. And we appreciate God's grace together. Your merciful grace, loving Trinity, constantly works to transform our lives. You take us from wandering to wandering, from the dark to the light, from isolation to community, from confusion to clarity, from despair to joy, and from death to eternal life. Make us ever more grateful for this redemptive power in our lives and guide us to represent your reconciling grace wisely to bless this world. And we'll sing our prayer for illumination. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us. Unmute yourself, Ryan. So Lynn wasn't able to make it this morning, um, so I'm happy to uh, do the scripture readings. Uh, we begin with Psalm 30. A psalm of thanksgiving for recovery. 
I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Shoal, restored me to life from among those who had gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face and I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I give you thanks forever. And as we continue to read through uh, the records we have of Paul's conversation with the Galatians, we've reached that passage in the second chapter um, that runs from verse 15 to 21. We ourselves are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners. And yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if, in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. This is the written word of God, a witness to the living word, Jesus Christ, understood through the witness of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. So those of you who don't know Ross, um, he's famous for his bow ties. And I was trying to blow this up and it got a bit fuzzy, but I, is it Calvin or Knox? It's Calvin. It's definitely Calvin. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. pretty awesome, eh? John Calvin bow tie. No kidding. I love it. And, <laughs> and if you if you uh, if you ever go to Ross's office, and I would encourage you to make an appointment with Ross and just go talk to him because he's a neat guy to talk to. But you will find his office filled with Reformation memorabilia. Um, it, he's a great collector of all things like bobbleheads and it, it's a wonderful place. It's just, it's just uh, delightful. I once had a buddy who taught uh, theology down at the um, University of Chicago, Tom Parker. And uh, he used to say, look, read through the institutes again. Every page, there's at least one or two references to the alluring and attractive love of God. And you get that. In, in Ross's office, and you, as you'll see, you get it from Ross too. So, um, Dean of St. Andrews Hall, um, one of my distinguished successors there, founding director of the Center for Missional Leadership, professor of, mis professor of mission at Vancouver School of Theology, author of several books, including Better Than Brunch, 
missional churches in Cascadia. There's a note on the uh, books that may, might better Brentwood uh, section of our website um, in which I do a review of the book asking the question, is Brentwood better than brunch? Um, and the final line in that review is, oh, and by the way, we serve brunch every Sunday when we're together, when we're together. Anyhow, um, Ross, wonderful to have you with us this morning. Uh, I'm going to go to, so before the sermon, we always invite people in the congregation to uh, either speak into the service or write in the chat box um, their understanding of a word that relates to the sermon. And so this morning, what, what comes to mind when you ponder the word salvation? What comes to mind when you hear the word salvation? Grace, yes. <laughs> ah, to be freed, yes. Key theme in, uh, in Galatians, Victoria, thank you for that. God's plan for his creation. Yeah, thanks, Reg. God's wholeness and healing. Yeah, yeah. feeling of completeness. Ah, forgiven. Critical piece in all of this, isn't it? Grace upon grace, given freely and completely to all without um, barrier or condition. Joy, yeah. God's love for us, absolutely. Good, well, don't hesitate to continue to write ideas into the chat as we move forward. And we'll make sure they all get saved and then recorded in the notes um, for the sermon that uh, that Ross will send to us and we'll post on the website. And um, so let us move on to the sermon. And Ross, you've got a PowerPoint slide, so I'm going to stop this share and we'll switch to your share. Terrific. Thanks so much. It's just really lovely to be with you. Thanks to Brian for the invitation to worship. And uh, thanks to Brentwood for the way in which you have supported and cared for so many uh, who are in leading in the church. And in particular, uh, Dan, uh, who is such a blessing to us at St. Andrew's Hall as our chapel <laughs> musician. Uh, fingers crossed and raised to heaven. We think we'll be back in person in September and it'll be so good to have uh, Dan back at the piano, but he did a great job of recording and of course often uh, would draw in Ben. Uh, and uh, Ben, we're just delighted to have you uh, studying with us this fall at the Vancouver School of Theology. So what an interesting passage. I had um, a lot of fun this week sitting with this passage and wrestling with it and trying to figure out how best to spend our time together. Uh, as we were looking at Galatians 2. I love that you're reading through uh, through Galatians. So where, where to begin with this passage? So I think we had we had if we has had uh, talked about um, there's a couple of questions that you suggested we focus this around if that's okay. That's brilliant and okay. I wasn't sure uh, when, when we were going to get to those so uh, I yeah, don't so have those fine. on slide. If you have those on slide feel free to put them up or I can pop them in the chat box. Okay, um, let me just, uh, I'll, I'll read them. Yeah, great. Um, so, and then, and then you can take it wherever you want to take it. Sure. <laughs> it's it fine, it fine Brentwood tradition. 
Um, so spoken or unspoken, what are the assumptions that we make in the church about who's in, who's out, and why? And obviously this is a, an important issue in our denomination, if not within the, the church worldwide today. So who's in, who's out, and why? Yeah, thanks for that. And so, you know, when, it, when I was thinking about the passage for this week, and we'll get to that in a few minutes, clearly there is a debate in the early church about uh, who actually counts as someone who is saved by and through the grace of Jesus Christ. And I think that has, that has continued uh, generation after generation. The, the labels change, Jew and Gentile back then, uh, they continue to change uh, down through the years, whether it be Protestant, Catholic, uh, today, uh, gay, straight, and so forth. There's always these um, demarcation lines about who's in and, and who's out. And I think, you know, one of the um, one of the the challenges is for us to always have um, a posture of humility, knowing mm -hmm. that that God's um, the the arc of God's justice is towards inclusion. God God is um, a God of wholeness of healing. Uh, God is one who longs to be in relationship with human beings. And human beings being human are sinful by nature. I am, we all are, we know it's a fallen world. But the story of the gospel is one of, um, of redemption, of, uh, of repairing what is broken. And I think that the who's in and who's out one, I, I think about um, many years ago. Ross, uh, were you, did you, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I just wasn't sure whether you wanted the slides up now or because they aren't up yeah sorry so um so that that's more for if uh having me uh present the sermon time later so that's that yeah no problem okay. um so uh yeah so this question of who's in and who's out i think we we could all tell stories of um uh, of the the real challenge of where we draw those lines I can think of a, of a congregation on the North Shore that was a, a very uh, conservative, uh, closed congregation. And it had a very clear understanding of, of who is in and who is out. And it eventually dwindled down to its last four members. And uh, I remember an elderly couple in their 90s uh were two of the four that were last left and they came down to the church that i was serving that theologically was not at all aligned um but it was within walking distance of their condo and they just seemed to be happy to be in church um, but i later found out that church was sold and turned into condos which happens um but i was talking to the real estate agent who did the deal and uh, he was sharing that the conditions were that he could sell the church building to um, the highest, obviously the highest bidder, but the only condition was he could not sell it to another Christian church because they had the, the pure gospel. I just remember being, oh, really? being so hurt by that, thinking, ah, oh, like that's the worst of who's in and who's out, right? That we'll, we will go down to our end trusting that our human made kind of distinctions between who belongs and who doesn't uh, wins the day. So now they were lovely people, we're happy to have them, but it's that kind of collective uh, who's in and who's out that I find really challenging. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so maybe we should go to your slides. Yeah, great. Yeah. Terrific. Now I've prepared like a like a, a bit of a teaching time. Is that is that what you have in mind, Brian? Is that okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay, good, awesome. Uh, with an interview yeah. sermon, uh, you know, speaking in different churches, sometimes it goes different ways. So I don't want to overshare, but um, I do certainly want to um, to share some reflections on this passage today because it is such a good it's such a good passage that you've given. I, I was thinking about um, many years ago when I was pastoring on the North Shore, uh, we held a, a large funeral at the church that I was serving. And it was um, a really tragic funeral. Uh, a young mother in her 30s uh, was killed in a ski accident in Whistler. Yeah. We all know that happens from time to time. Uh, really unexpected kind of a freak accident. 
And as hundreds of people filed out of the sanctuary, there was one young woman who sat in a pew for a long time, wiping away her tears. Uh, she came up and shook my hand and thanked me for the service. Uh, and she paused at the door to mention, um, you know, just how devastating her friend's death had been, how she was holding her kids closer, and how comforting the, the words in the funeral were to her. And then she hesitated, I still remember this, and she said this, I'm feeling like I, I need faith, like I need God right now, but I'm not quite sure how it works. I haven't been to church before. I wonder if I could like come on a, is it a Sunday, I think you guys have your service and how does that work? And I was kind of processing all of this. And then she said, can I just show up or do I need to be like sponsored in? Is it like a private club or something? Mm. I just remember thinking, wow, like, of course, you know, I assured her and what you would do, all of you, I assured her she'd be most welcome. And then I silently prayed that our hospitality and our living out of the gospel, if she showed up, would be sufficient, right, to minister to this grieving person. And she did show up the next Sunday. Uh, and the following Sunday, she brought her husband and her kids. And over the next few years, I watched as they continued to explore in community what it meant to follow Jesus and who God was both with them and for them in Jesus Christ. But on the day of the funeral, as I stood at the back door after that young woman had left, I reflected on her question. She asked on whether she could join the church or if it was a private club she needed to be sponsored into. I began to think, you know, every church I've served and think all of us in Zoom worship today, all the different churches you've belonged to over the years, um, we always hear that we're a friendly church. Like I'm still waiting to be invited to preach at a church where they put up signs saying we are the unfriendly church. Yeah. I will report back to you, friends, if, if I discover that church. But I think about congregations I've served from the Maritimes through here to BC. Everyone claims to be friendly. And yet, this young woman still had to articulate the question, would she be welcome? How does it work? Is she sponsored in? I think in many ways, that's what's at stake in Paul's letter to the Galatians. Who's in, who's out, and why? Now, you've been looking at Galatians, and so you know that it's a densely worded conversation that we're eavesdropping on here from 2021, looking back between members of the early church. He's probably writing this letter, you know, it's a bit of a, a, a guesswork here, somewhere between 48 and 54 AD, likely from the city of Ephesus. Galatia, as you may know, is part of the, the larger Roman province of Asia Minor that we simply call Turkey today. And this is on his first missionary journey. So he's kind of the sidekick to Barnabas here, a little bit like Batman and Robin. And when you visit places in Galatia today, you can go to places, uh, I visited a little place called Poseidon Antioch. Uh, Ephesus, of course, is not part of Galatia, but part of Turkey, and it's crowded with, you know, uh, uh, cruise ship passengers and stuff. But Poseidon Antioch, there's almost no one there when you go and it's the place of Paul's first preach where Barnabas kind of gives him the nudge and says, okay, you're on. And he begins to, um, to practice proclaiming the gospel. And as he plants these churches with Barnabas, he continues to um, be able to follow up with them and to try and figure out uh, how best to serve these churches. But often we think, I think when we read the New Testament, we assume Paul is such a dominant figure that he was seen that way in the early church, but there were so many preachers of the gospel being sent out, almost like we send so many missionaries around the world today, and keeping a consistent message is tricky, right? And so obviously here in the letter to the Galatians, there is um, a problem with other preachers of the gospel who have um, arrived. And uh, these uh, fellow Jews like Paul insist that God God's work through Jesus means that the Galatians, who are Gentiles or non-Jews, like all of us, I assume, in worship today, that they need to convert to Judaism's traditions in order to be a real Christian, specifically circumcision, certain calendar events they should follow, and dietary restrictions. Well, you've been reading, so you know that Paul is furious, right? And he writes a, a complex theological argument to those in this house church or churches in Galatia, 
urging them to stop following this new teaching and instead to understand that to embrace the law as Gentiles is to deny the complete sufficiency of God's work for salvation. And he illustrates how this very issue is not limited to the guest preachers in Galatia, but then he tells them about an incident that I hope you've had a chance to study as you've been reading through uh, Galatians. He looks backwards in time to Antioch of Syria. It, today, it's also in the country of Turkey, just 20 clicks above the Syrian border. And it's a really helpful part of the puzzle as we're in this conversation today and we're wrestling with what, what is Paul really meaning in this really dense scripture that we've read. Uh, and so, of course, we realize that Paul is um, deeply uh, steeped in Jewish tradition, uh, a Torah scholar, uh, and he has this powerful transformative encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, right? And uh, it turned the early church's most zealous persecutor into its most effective evangelist. In Paul's missionary work, he participated in the Holy Spirit's work of taking the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And this outward movement of the gospel translating across cultures and various publics meant that those who were not Jewish heard the gospel that a crucified Jew now ruled the cosmos. And through this crucified Jew, now the world is being reconciled unto God. An incredible message. It was paradigm breaking, life altering, boundary crossing. It was a message of reconciliation and redemption. And Paul himself, of course, is an observant Jew. He understands how difficult it was for those in Jerusalem, members of the early church, to comprehend what God had done and was doing through the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. So as, um, I don't know, shall we call him a proto-Presbyterian? Paul follows good process. He goes to Jerusalem. He attends an early version of General Assembly. And he brings an overture to change the doctrine of the emerging way of Jesus we call the church. And it's all recorded in the same chapter of Galatians. Perhaps you guys had a chance to, to look at it uh, in, uh, as you've been working your way through Galatians. So we have this recording. Don't worry, I'm not going to read it, but it's there for you to scan. <laughs> it's a recording of what happens when they go to Jerusalem, right? And there's this whole kind of gathering like a general assembly. And he receives, by, uh, he receives the blessing of those uh, who are there and all is well. But then we have this other piece in the same chapter in Galatians, where uh, Paul kind of embarrasses Peter. Now, Peter is like uh, kind of like the moderator's visit when he came to, uh, to Antioch, right? And, uh, and Paul tells this story of where Peter was just fine dining, sitting at table with Gentiles, sharing food, until a faction showed up who reminded him that's not the way it was supposed to be. So it's kind of like the moderator's visit. Everyone's excited. Peter the Rock comes to Antioch, embraces all their ministry programs. He helps in the food bank ministry, gets on the floor and has fun with the kids at Messy Church, takes a hearty helping at the congregational potluck dinner, preaches about God's inclusive love revealed in Jesus. And then as these folks arrive from Jerusalem, I don't know, maybe they're the follow-up team, who knows, they're shocked at what they see, Jews and Gentiles mixing freely in the name of Jesus. It's outrageous to them. And Peter, under pressure from these visitors, perhaps worried a little bit about his reputation when he gets back to head office, withdraws from table fellowship. Well, Paul is the kind of guy who simply says what polite Canadians think, but often fail to verbalize. <laughs> he tears into Peter, essentially challenging the moderator's ruling in polity terms, and reminds everyone of the right hand of fellowship and the decision made properly in Jerusalem. Now, there's debate about the order of these stories that Paul tells in Galatians 2. It may seem a bit off compared to the telling of Acts 15. But what was really important here is the understanding that this is uh, really a part of what Paul is describing in the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15.1. Uh, that, that that's a significant turning point in the life of the church towards inclusion. John Calvin, when he comments on um, this uh, Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem, he says, whoever intelligently considers all the circumstances will, I hope, agree with me in thinking that uh, this happened before the apostles had decided the Gentiles should not be worried about ceremonies. So in other words, the, the debate of the order of these stories is, is a bit of a free-for-all. Most people think, okay, so Peter uh, had this incident in Antioch before the Council of Jerusalem, 
made their decision. Wh whatever order it's in, by today's reading, Paul rolls right into Galatians 2.15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Some have suggested the opening line, we ourselves are Jews, might be a sarcastic swipe at Peter. Well, that's possible. But I kind of like Martin Luther's translation in 1519, where he says, we are sinners of Jewish, not Gentile origin. Mm -hmm. In other words, declaring that everyone is, uh, everyone is a sinner. Now, he reverses course in 1531, and I think he was under some pressure. And if you know much about Luther, he was not always kind to Jewish people. So he may have reversed his order. But his original translation, I thought, was really helpful on that. Calvin, again, when we look at what um, Calvin notes of this um, justification that comes up here, it's such an important term. And when Brian and I were talking about today, we we're noting about this term. It, it's not really one that we use much anymore, right? Paul says we are justified. It's an odd term to our 2021 ears. But maybe one way to think about it is like Microsoft or Google Docs will justify a paragraph, right? Taking our disheveled words and tidying them up. So in Jesus Christ, uh, God uh, makes right our relationship with God, our creator, and with creation, including fellow humanity, not through our goodness or our action, but through his sacrificial death on the cross. As Paul writes in verse 20, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what Calvin says about Christ self-emptying on the cross in this passage. No words can rightly express what it means uh, what this means, for who can find language to declare the excellency of the Son of God? We're struggling to put into human words something that is, is so paradigm-breaking in what God has done. I think, too, in our highly individualistic culture today, we often hear about justification or salvation sometimes we use as a phrase people are more familiar with. But of course, um, there's a sense in which we need to make sure that we're also describing this not just in individual terms, for as important as that is, and for as important as our own story is, but how we root that in um, a more communal experience. That's why we belong to church. That's why we care for one another and are deeply engaged with one another. It's a challenge in many ways for us um, to be able to, to see how this plays out. But in the world of missional theology that, that I live in, there's a high priority placed on the local church in all its diversity. No two local churches are the same, but there's um, a preferential option for understanding that in the local church, just as you are gathered at Brentwood now, in this expression of church, you're figuring out what the gospel means. It's not that there's different gospels, but that the gospel really ultimately becomes um, real and enfleshed in the local. And so that's why all the distinctives that you have as a congregation uh, are important, just as they are for a church down, down the road. There's a sense in which we have um, to work out together what salvation means. You know, there's a sense in which we don't do this alone. That's probably the most encouraging piece that I find in, in working with churches is trusting that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is always active in the world and continually surprising us in God's activity. Now, as a reminder of that, just a, a couple of years ago, I was uh, speaking at a church in Edmonton and ordered up um, an Uber and uh, was waiting on the, the church lawn. The Uber uh, pulled up and uh, the driver had a shaved head with tattoos, a big leather jacket on, he was hunched over the wheel, ready to go. Uh, I smiled, said hello, and then settled into the back seat, reaching for my phone to check emails. To be honest, I was making assumptions that this driver would not really be in the mood for talking. Uh, just one block later, he kind of looked at me in the rearview mirror and he said, uh, what were you doing at that church? Uh oh, I said, uh, I was uh, speaking at a conference. So you're a Christian, he asked. I thought, oh, here we go. And uh, Brian and Jim, who are on uh, this Zoom call, know as clergy, one of the dangers is when, when people find out you're clergy, they just kind of dump all their bad experiences of church on you. To which those of us, if you want to see behind the curtain, most of us as clergy say, you know, take a number and get in line. We've got our beef with the church too. We've got our experiences, right? So I was thinking, here we go. This is going to be one of these stories. 
but no, uh, he said, uh, that's great. I'm a Christian too, but only recently, he said. Wow, I said, okay. I put my phone away. I said, tell, tell me about that as we're driving along. He said, well, my life was really messed up and I wasn't really a good person at all. I did things and said things. Well, there was just no way I could ever fix it on my own. I was facing a bad divorce, owed a lot of money. My kids hated me. I just realized one day that the world would be better off without me. So I went into a garage with my hunting rifle and I decided to end my life. I was thinking, jeepers, this guy's driving me very fast along a highway. I don't think I could bail out if this story goes the wrong way. I drove in silence for a moment. And then I said the obvious, duh. I said, well, you're here, so what happened? And very calmly, he said, Jesus showed up. I said, wow, uh, tell me more. He said, yeah, just before I was going to follow through, I saw Jesus. And he said, don't do it. I love you. And so I set down the gun, and Jesus gave me the biggest hug I've ever had in my life. <laughs> so I joined a church after that. My whole life has changed in that community. People who know me or fear me from before don't even recognize me today. They said, you've changed. And I say, nope, Jesus changed me. So friends, Jesus alone justifies. He's on the loose, calling, healing, saving people, redeeming the whole creation. May those who hear his voice and feel his embrace find as wide and warm a welcome in the communities that bear Christ's name. That was great. Thanks so much, Ross. My pleasure. And we look forward to uh, hearing what kind of questions get provoked by that uh, mm -hmm. among uh, Caden and uh, Ben as we get ready to do our podcast based on your sermon in a week or so. So thanks again for being with us and uh, digging into that question of who's in and who's out and why. Great, great reflections. Let me pull up. There we go. I think that final story about uh, the peace um, and wholeness that came to your Uber driving friend uh, leads nicely into Dan and Ben playing There is a Bomb in Gilead. So this is Brent Wood's uh, retelling, recalling of the story of God's saving mercy and grace that Ross has spoken so eloquently and powerfully about this morning. Um, and um, this is the reality that that Uber driver got 
drawn into, embraced into. So let's read it again together as we do every Sunday. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and declared them to be very good. God then created humanity in all our diversity to cultivate blessing throughout the world. Rejecting the limits of their power, our ancestors rebelled against God's vision of goodness. And by continuing to rebel against God's constraints, we compound the pain of toil, tyranny, trauma, and death. But God never gave up, as the Spirit reveals in the scriptures. In a definitive act of reconciling forgiveness, God became incarnate among us. In the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus of Nazareth, God restored the original goodness of creation as a commonwealth enjoyed on earth as it is in heaven. The Holy Spirit continues to work out the fulfillment of that act. Through the church universal in which we participate, the Holy Spirit nourishes us to flourish as God's friends through worship, learning, fellowship, and service. By God's grace in Jesus the Christ, through the Holy Spirit, we know what it is to be loved and to love amidst all the problems of the world. And we are equipped, empowered, and sent to sow the seeds of God's peace in all of our circles of influence. In the end, God's love will transform the heavens and the earth and bring justice, peace, and joy to every dimension of creation. So just a few um, comments about what's going on around Brentwood uh, these days at and through Brentwood. Um, we'll finalize our plans for gathering together again in person at our next session meeting, should be in the next week or so. Uh, taking to get into consideration all of the public health protocols. Um, general sense may change depending on health uh, announcements, but um, some of us figure we're probably looking at a September uh, start just to be really safe. Uh, we have received, remember we put in an application to the Presbyterian Innovative Ministries Fund to fund the composing and production of 52 songs for children and their families and congregations that would convey the message of the gospel over 52 key scripture passages. These are the ones that Dan and I chose back in, gosh, 2013 now for a series of sermons running from Genesis to Revelation. Um, and so we're looking at kind of a doing a Mr. Rogers kind of, of uh, song with them. We put in an uh, application to PIM. Um, they came back and said, uh, we think you should apply for more money. And, and expand the project. And we'll give you $5,000 to kind of sort it out and, and see what you can reimagine. Um, so we're gonna gladly accept that 5,000 apply again in the fall and see what we can, can do around that. But we're, we're greatly encouraged by that, to, um, that invitation to reapply and expand the scope of the project. Um, we also have mentioned that we did get some funding for our Gospel with Guitars program. This is uh, working with Inner Hope uh, Mission in Vancouver's East End. Um, Nate Hartley is uh, our connection there. We'll be working with him and then Rita Long, who's one of our elders and has been a guitar teacher for uh, two decades now. We'll be doing it. We'll be uh, doing it in collaboration with Trinity Grace United Church near Kings, uh, Kingsway and Fraser. That's where the uh, uh, the workshops will happen. Uh, but we would love to be able to find enough guitars to actually give these kids guitars of their own. Heinrich Bota, the minister at West Vancouver Presbyterian Church, is doing a course as a guitar tech. So he's going to recondition all of those guitars and keep them in shape as we go through the program. So uh, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're getting together on Monday morning to talk more about that. It'll begin in September. And so we got funding from the Cooks Fund through the fall, and then Trinity Grace is going to fund the second half of it uh, in the spring. The other thing to say is just is keep really safe through this heat wave. Just take care of yourself. Drink lots of water. 
um, Conrad Good's wife, Emily, so Desmond's mom, um, is, is a doctor. And one of the things that she suggested that Conrad emailed us this morning was uh, just take some fruit juice and mix it with the water. And that'll help you get your electrolytes. Um, you know, so you don't have to go out and buy uh, Gatorade and all of that sort of stuff, but just take a bit of orange juice, mix it with your water, and that'll give you the electrolytes as well as the hydration. So great advice. Thank you to Emily for that. The usual events during the week, um, the bar Bible study. Um, we, Ross, I think you know um, Elizabeth Jones in Montreal. So Elizabeth did a two-page summary of her doctoral thesis on using Midrash for us. And in that, she talks about following the white rabbit down the rabbit hole, Alice in Wonderland. And so we found that particularly, an particularly intriguing uh, image and metaphor for what we do on Wednesday afternoon. So we started calling ourselves the rabbit hole gang. And uh, Reg uh, Molnar gets us going with, with his idea of what rabbit holes he thinks we should explore. And we go down those and then we find all sorts of other ones that run off that. So it's a, it's a wonderful 90 minute conversation. You're all welcome to come along. Um, prayer group on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Um, and uh, we just wanted to recognize each week that the church really is you in the community, right? So that as we gather, we get nourished to flourish, but the service that the church renders to the world takes place through each and every one of you, literally one conversation after another, um, as you learn more about and appropriate more fully the nine teachings of the apostles in all of your relationships and as we finish the service, we'll sing those nine teachings again. So thank you uh, for that. We do every week invite you to continue to contribute to God's generosity through Brentwood. That's, that's how we see ourselves being in the world, sharing God's generosity. Uh, and your donations help us do that. So you, by check, by e-transfer, um, or you can go to our donate button on the website through Canada Helps. And we thought this would be an appropriate uh, song to sing a couple of verses of as we uh, reflect further on Ross's insights. Thanks to Dan and Ben for the, that rendition of God of Mercy, God of Grace. Um, I love the kind of feel of healing peace that came through that, that pace for the hymn. So thank you so much. Let me pull up the chat again. Go. Uh, please feel free as we begin our prayers of the people to write those prayers into the chat, uh, to speak them into the worship service. Uh, given what uh, we have been confirming and discovering over the past couple of weeks, um, there will certainly be, I would imagine, 
references to traumatic events. Um, and uh, as I'll say in a couple of minutes, uh, there will also be references to suicide in our prayers this morning. So please take note of that um, if any of that might trigger you. Reg, Rick Thompson, so Ross and those that have joined us uh, this morning, perhaps for the first time, Reg is a, or Rick is a good friend of Reg's, uh, lives in the States, is awaiting a double hand transplant, has been for months and months and months, it keeps getting uh, postponed uh, because of, of COVID needs, and so we keep him in our prayers uh, every week. And of course, the residential school families. Um, ah, Victoria, your daughter Ruth and her unborn child to be delivered on July the 10th. We will continue to keep, we will keep that in our prayers and uh, for a safe delivery. The homeless dealing with the heat. Yes, Mary. People facing challenging medical procedures. Um, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. Lynn Dukey's daughter has broken her ankle. Ouch. Um, and there are um, others. One of our grandsons is going in for a surgical procedure this coming week. So we ask our, your prayers for, for him. Another of our grandsons, um, two friends have overdosed and one has committed suicide in the past three or four weeks. And so that's um, hit him particularly hard. Uh, prayers for he and, and uh, his network of friends. Um, there are people within the congregation who are undergoing uh, various treatments um, for uh, various diseases, and so we keep them in our minds. Um, Reg, yes, the nurses and the caregivers, uh, people that we take for granted. Um, people like Vanessa Boadu who works down at in the in the uh, COVID ward down at St. Paul's Hospital. Um, Simon, yes, dealing with depression and, and anxiety um, and certainly in our networks and, and relationships with the jazz community. Um, we encounter uh, many who are living with and through uh, those conditions and we try to be a an encouraging and healing presence with them. Um, and Pam, Indigenous peoples are, as, as Reg mentioned, as well, coming to terms with, with the unmarked grave, graves. Um, I, my hunch is that we are just seeing the tip of the iceberg in, in confirmations of those graves on the sites of residential schools. And um, learning how to be with our indigenous kin in their re-traumatization and grief over that um, is will be a challenge for many of us in the church who have bought into modernity's project of fixing everything um, and there are no easy fixes in in my sense We raise to God all of the prayers that have not been articulated uh, this morning, but that uh, trouble uh, and calm our souls. And we sing again the words that uh, our Lord taught us when in the flesh with us. Uh, listening afresh for the, the rich depth and breadth of how that prayer encompasses so many of ours and embraces us in our laments. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Sins as we forgive those who 
sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Now and forever. So this is the little song that we've composed here at Brentwood um, based on uh, Galatians 5. We call it the nine teachings of the apostles. Um, we take the language in the uh, most of the English translations, which talks about self-control and self-mastery, um, and uh, improvise with it a little bit because there is an older meaning of the Greek that has to do with composure. And we think that sense of composing ourselves with and in the presence and for uh, the purpose that God created us um, helps us think about it in a slightly different way. So we'll sing it three times, good Trinitarian stuff, uh, to receive it, to enjoy it, and then to think about how we might share these teachings as we go forth into God's world. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-composure. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-composure. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-composure. Oops, there we go. Let's pray. Our home is with you, dear Lord, through your hospitality, hope, and healing. So restore us ever more fully into your kinship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Ross and Victoria, or uh, yeah, I think um, you may not have seen the, the, the ones who haven't seen this painting yet. It's by Lord Zarabeski, who did the image of the church and did the image of the Trinity Trio, which is our jazz imagery. Um, two parables are particularly meaningful to us around Brentwood. One is the parable of the sower. The other is the parable of the prodigal son, as you may have seen in some of the other pictures. Um, but uh, this, Laura is in the midst of um, painting another picture of the, the homecoming for the prodigal son. Uh, this one's of the sowers, um, and both of those paintings are done in honor of the late Emmanuel Boadu, one of our elders who was from Ghana. And uh, you can see there the church below us, the city, the seeds all being sown. And on the large person's uh, seed bag is the uh, um, Ghana's flag and Emmanuel's uh, Ghanaian name, uh, Kwame. So uh, that's a, an important piece for us. 
We are deeply grateful to the many artists who enrich our PowerPoint with uh, their images. So there's a uh, recognition of them. And thanks again for participating with us, Ross. A special thank you to you for being with us and uh, sharing that wisdom with us. We uh, look forward to the recording of the podcast and our ongoing collaboration with St. Andrews Hall and with VST. God bless all. <laughs>